and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the news and top-selling Spectrum games from February 1986. I draw on my television screen. I play some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Give you some playing tips. Visit Type in Corner. And end with my demo of the month. But first, it's back to February 1986. The big news this month that dominates most magazines is the arrival of Sinclair's new micro, the Spectrum 128. It's been months in coming, and the public have been eagerly waiting to get their hands on it after all of the rumours, speculation and hype that has been circulating for what seems like ages. The official launch date has been set for 13th of February, with trade viewings already taking place. The machine should hit the shelves later in the month for the public to buy, and the price has been set at £179.99, including a software bundle. The unit will not come with a numeric keypad as it did in Spain, but this will be available to buy for an additional 1995. The software houses have been busy, in fact there are over 30 companies producing titles already. In a surprise announcement too, Sir Clive stated that he intends to work on a disk drive system for the 128 machine as soon as possible, saying that Spectrum technology will certainly be around in 1988 and beyond. Sinclair have sold all the marketing and distribution rights for its Pocket TV to Timex, the company who has been manufacturing the unit since day one. This means that, although the unit will carry the Sinclair name and logo, it will not be a Sinclair product and all the profit will go to Timex. Sinclair are keen to point out that they are still looking at flat screen televisions and are hopeful that they will play a large part in future products. Two independent surveys both place Sinclair at the top of the list when it comes to home micros. One company, AGB, gives Sinclair 37% of the market, while the second, Wood Mackenzie, give them 35. This is a much larger share than their nearest rivals, Commodore and Amstrad, who both have around 16 to 23%, depending on who you believe. On the whole, though, micro sales are down by 17%, with only 1.1 million units sold last year. If you're ever jealous of televisions that have teletext, then help is at hand. Bollex has produced a device that, when connected to your Spectrum, will let you view all UK broadcasts, including telesoftware downloads. Remember, at this time, teletext was a feature that not all televisions had, so being able to view it on your Spectrum was a novelty. The unit will cost £99.99. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. Coming to the chart this month, Formula One Simulator from Mastertronic. Gun Fright from Ultimate Play the Game. Caves of Doom from Mastertronic. Barry McGuigan's World Championship Boxing from Activision. And Movie from Imagine. And that was the news and top selling games from February 1986. After my previous features about light guns and the purchase of a larger CRT television, I was looking for something else I could use the setup for. And the thing that sprang to mind was of course a light pen. There were several available for the Spectrum, including one from DK Tronics. This is mine. Unfortunately, it doesn't work all that well, but this one, from Daytel Electronics, seems to function okay. In the box you get some software, an interface that's about the same size as a joystick adapter, and the pen itself, which is about the same size as a normal pen, but a little lighter. No pun intended. And of course an instruction sheet. Once plugged in and the software loaded, it was time to play. There's a short calibration tool which allows you to save the settings afterwards, and then you're taken straight into the drawing program. 
The package, called Lightwriter, gives you various functions such as circle, line and fill. In my version, probably an early release of the software that I couldn't find on the internet, there is a series of boxes at the bottom of the screen, all with a letter above them. Each one represents a command, for example K allows you to clear the screen. We'll look at a different version of the software later on. The options are selected via the menu at the bottom of the screen, and to select them you hold the pen over the box and press the associated key. All a bit strange really. The cursor position is moved by placing the pen on screen and pressing any key. You can set this by holding the pen over the C box and pressing C. To draw a circle for example, you would first set the crosshair by positioning the pen on screen and pressing C, moving the pen a slight distance away and pressing any key again to move the crosshair, hold the pen over the D box and press D, and you get a circle. To fill any object, you move the pen inside the object and press any key to move the crosshair position, move the pen over the F box and press F. One of the first things that you notice is the screen flicker. As with light gun games, the raster is used to get the position of the pen, so the screen has to blank so that it can detect where the pen is. This means there's a lot of flickering. Drawing freehand produces constant screen flash, which was very off-putting and you had to press a key to stop drawing rather than pulling away from the screen. Pulling the pen away caused the program to switch to a white screen, meaning that it had lost the position. Putting the pen back on screen would result in a line being drawn from the last point to the new point. Drawing to the edge of the screen caused the software to think that the pen had moved to the opposite side and prompted drew a line straight across. Very annoying. All too often I found myself clearing the screen and trying again. There's no undo feature. There is a delete function, but it didn't seem to do very much. The fill tool works well, but is a little bit slow, especially on larger areas. It's also very easy to miss a pixel when you're drawing a freehand shape, and the resulting fill will take up the whole screen and a lot of time. You can change ink and paper colours, but obviously you get colour clash at certain points. And once you've drawn your masterpiece, you can save it to tape. The version of the software on the world of Spectrum is different and replaces the boxes with icons that look a lot more professional. In operation it's also a lot better. You don't have to press the correct key now. Any key will do as long as you're holding the pen over the correct icon. Some icons have multiple choice options that pop up as well and to select these you just move the pen to whichever you want and press any key. So much faster and better. It was interesting to use the pen. The older software was terrible to use, but the newer software gave a much more fluent experience. Maybe I was expecting too much. As a gadget then, it's cool to have and fun to mess about with. As a serious tool though, I have my doubts. The software is a bit clunky and it's all too easy to make mistakes. The screen flicker, as with the light gun games, gets very annoying and soon gives you a headache. So, it's fun, but that's about all. Road Racer from Thorn EMI was released in 1983 and from the cover and title, you can guess the type of game this is going to be. With this being a 16K game, there are no frills, no fancy intro, just a control selection at the start, and you're straight into the game. There's no story or background, no league tables, no constructor championship, no track selection or driver names. It's just a driving game, where you have to reach the end of the track without crashing too many times. The screen shows you a tachometer and speedometer, along with gears, points, miles and time. Gears are limited to high and low, and these have to be changed when the tachometer is white, otherwise you'll blow your engine up. 
you don't get a countdown to the start, so as soon as you press S to begin, you have to hit the accelerator to avoid cars crashing into the back of you. Once in high gear, you have to deal with the other cars in front of you, and the track. The corners are hardly noticeable really, so you don't have to apply the brake to get round them. The hardest part is judging where the other cars will move to. The early stages and it's not too bad, but as you get onto higher tracks, they tend to move about more often. The graphics are large and well drawn, and things move along quite smoothly. You can hit the sides of the roads too without crashing or doing any damage, which I suppose is a bonus. Control is responsive, but have you spotted or rather heard the emission? Yes, the game is silent, unless you crash. This is quite a major problem, as playing without an engine sound reduces the overall effect, I think. I know it's a 16K game and I know it was released in 1983, but there should have been something to listen to. The crash sound proves that the author knew how to make sound, and the game itself is just over 5K, so there was plenty of room. Anyway, leaving out the sound, the game isn't too bad. Not the best racing game for the Spectrum, but for its time quite playable. Remember this is just a 5k program so don't expect too much from it, and if it makes you feel better you can put on some loud music or make the engine sound yourselves. Ultima Ratio was released by Firebird Software in 1987. There is a backstory. The Earth is under threat from the most powerful weapon known, a massive nine-stage battle platform. To destroy it, a skilled pilot has to navigate each stage and destroy everything on it. Only then can he move to the next one. The game is a shoot 'em up Well, a kind of shoot all round really, and it could be compared to a vertical Uridium. You fly up and down the large colourful levels, blasting everything and anything that you see. And that's the main problem with the game. There are no clear indications of what to shoot and what to ignore, what will let you fly over it and what won't. And this causes you to waste a lot of time and a lot of ammo. The flying ships and aliens are obvious targets, but there are blocks that you just can't destroy, and some that you can. I guess after playing for a period of time, you get to identify these, but I think it would have been better to mark them out more clearly. There are other blocks that reverse your controls, and there's no real reason for these, other than to annoy you, as they serve no constructive purpose and don't add anything to the game. If there had been areas only accessible when using reverse controls, then it could have made a bit more sense. At the bottom of the level, you'll find a block indicating you should fly over it to complete that stage. And you spend a lot of time flying over it with nothing happening, and then you have to head back through all the rest of the screens trying to find out what you've missed. All this is against a timer too, which at least is displayed on screen, unlike your ammo or shields. If you run out of ammo, you can refill by flying over a certain block, but the instructions didn't say which one. Luckily, I found out by accident. Once all of the aliens and blocks have been destroyed, you fly over the end block and the next level begins. The action is much the same throughout the game really, shoot a lot of things, dodge a lot of things, and keep an eye on the timer. The graphics are very colourful, and because of this the screen does not scroll, instead it uses a sort of screen by screen push scroll. Some blocks kill you instantly too, which is a bit unfair. Some blocks when shot remove the enemy for a period of time. But again, in the thick of battle, it's difficult to tell which blocks you shot anyway. Sound-wise, the game has some good effects, to keep things bubbling along. Playability grows on you as you get to know what to shoot and what to avoid, but the gameplay is repetitive all the way through.
This is not a bad game really, just not a great one. This is Guardian from PSS, released in 1983. There isn't any story to this game, just a few brief lines about avoiding strangely named aliens such as trackers, swirls and snarks. If you hadn't already guessed by the cover, it's a clone of the classic arcade game Tempest. First thing you notice is the speed of the player. It's far faster than the arcade, making it difficult to be accurate. The idea, as with the arcade game, is to destroy all of the aliens as they move towards you, across various shaped tunnels, although in this game the tunnels always seem to be square. Once past the first level, and the game drifts away from the arcade format by offering different playability. Here you simply have to move around, dodging the asteroids. The problem is, because of the speed of the player, it's very tricky to do, and more often than not, I ended up moving into an asteroid rather than avoiding it. Once past this, and it's back to the tunnel again. As well as your normal laser weapon, you have two Star Smashers, and when triggered, kill everything in the current tunnel. The graphics are smooth enough, but the aliens are small and not animated. The sound is quite good for an early arcade clone, with various zaps and explosions, and the Star Smasher effect is quite nice. Control is responsive, but with the movement being too fast, it just spoils what otherwise could have been a good game. has good gameplay, but all too often it ends frustratingly, as you hurtle into the next set of aliens. If you like Tempest, give it a try, otherwise I think you may find it too frustrating. Gimme Bright was released in 2011 by Climacus, and is a platform game based on the arcade machine City Connection. The aim of the game is to change the colour of all the platforms on the level, and avoid getting killed. There are various enemies out to get you, although they don't seem to have much intelligence, and just wander about. But this doesn't mean to say that the game is easy, far from it, at least for me. You can also die by falling down at the bottom of the screen. The jump mechanism is a bit odd, but does reflect how the arcade machine worked, and timing your jumps is key to the success of this game. You're also constantly moving, so this increases the tension. The gameplay is fast and frantic, as you desperately try to reach platforms and stay alive. The graphics are large and well drawn, and well animated, and move really well. The control is crisp, but it does take time to get used to jumping. Sound is used well, with some good tunes on the game menu and nice effects when you play. I can remember playing a similar game on the Amiga, and being addicted, and although the idea is the same, 
I think the reduced screen size of the Spectrum and large sprites limits the freedom of the player a bit, especially as you can't jump through platforms. Overall then, a good fast platform game that will appeal to players of this type of game. Once you get the hang of the jump control, the game improves quite a lot, so why not give it a try? Today on Plane Tips we're going to be looking at Wheelie. Wheelie is from Microsphere, the people who also did games like School Days, and it was one of their first. And what you have to do is drive from the left hand side of the screen to the right hand side of the screen through a scrolling screen and get to the Ghost Rider, then race him back to the end. And that's pretty much all there is to it. There are various obstacles in the way, things that you've got to jump, various animals that get in your way and you also have a certain amount of fuel and extra fuel you can pick up during the game. So the first tip concerns the fuel and it is a really really boring tip because if you go really really slowly in the game you don't use any fuel at all. So, when you get to the end and you meet the Ghost Rider, you'll be able to collect all the fuel on the way back and will never ever run out. Now, while you're doing this, you do sometimes have to speed up for some of the obstacles like the little humps that make you do a wheelie and to get up ramps but you still use a lot less fuel than you would if you were going faster so okay that's the first tip and yes that was a bit of a boring one and I deliberately spoke slowly on it <laughs> to be honest with you that, that tip is useful even if you don't go slow all the time because what you can do is if you're running out of fuel you can slow down and the basis of the tip is don't go full revs through the game because your fuel goes down really really quickly if actually you go slightly under revs you do use a lot less fuel so that's probably a better tip but, but going at absolute minimum speed is a good one and if, you, if you've never tried it actually give it a go because it, it makes the game a different challenge but it does make the game slightly less boring and you do you do get to absolutely peg it back after you've faced the ghost rider at the end anyway so the next tip I'm going to give you is how to jump over the cars and buses that you see. I was watching a video on YouTube where someone was attempting to do this and not doing a very good job. And actually, once you get the knack, it's pretty easy. Now, in the game, it doesn't show you that you have gears on your bike. But the way that the speed and the revs act, it's as if you do. And what you find is that in top gear, you're going as fast as you can and then you can control the revs. So to jump over a bus or a car, what you want to do is get yourself into top gear and your MPH to be significantly higher than your revs. You don't want to be full revs at top gear, you just want your MPH to be up near the top and your revs to be a bit lower, slightly above halfway. And if you do that, you can just jump over a car and bus all day long. You can jump over it one way, turn round, turn back, jump over another way and keep going for as long as you want. Or maybe not, you might crash sometimes. Okay, that's Wheelie, and that's the two playing tips for Wheelie. I hope they help, and until next time, happy playing! Welcome to Typing Corner, giving you games not seen in over 20 years. This month's game is Beltman, written by T. Wiley and published in the July 1983 issue of Popular Computing Weekly. The game came in four sections, a large basic program and three short machine code listings. 
Once loaded up, we get a version of Jumping Jack, and not a bad one at that. The idea, if you didn't know Jumping Jack, is that you have to jump up through the holes in the conveyor belt to reach the fuses at the top. You can fall down the holes too, but you don't die when you hit the bottom. But it does mean you have to keep an eye on everything. Luckily there are boxes at certain points that when stood on will stop you falling down. When you get to the top of the screen you have to grab one of the fuses to score points and the next level begins. The fuses worth and your score increases from left to right from between 10 and 300 points so the skill in the game is to head for the top right. For a typing in 1983 this is actually not a bad game. Good fun to play and easy to control and it certainly passes a few minutes. This game has not been seen since it was first published and will be available to download from my blog shortly. This month we're going to take a slight deviation. And while I rub it on a bit, here are some stunning pieces of artwork, all created on the Spectrum. Even though the Spectrum had, originally, just a simple beep command to generate sound, some of the games released made great use of it. When the 1 to 8K machines arrived with their 3 channel AY chip, music took another large step forward. But to make music on the original hardware is still seen as a challenge. And one name springs to mind when it comes to beeper music, Mr. Beep. Recording his music direct from real hardware, he has created some remarkable tunes and often releases them as MP3 albums. For the technical out there, the Spectrum had many sound engines, known as beeper engines, usually borrowed or modified from games, but the base sound capabilities was a one channel, one bit square wave beep with no effects or even volume control. Given this specification, it's remarkable that with clever coding, you can get up to 9 channels of sound. The music you are hearing in the background is from the latest MP3 album by Mr. Beep, called Chromospheric Flares. tracks all range in style and use a variety of different engines, and the results considering it's coming from a Spectrum are quite amazing. Mr Beep has provided music for a good number of freeware games released over the last few years, and if you like computer music, then I'm sure you're going to appreciate the tracks that he releases from time to time. Of all the tracks on this album, I have my favourites, as I'm sure you will, so why not give them a spin? Well that's the end of this episode, I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon!